the platelet has to go to the injured tissue and it sticks to the tissue. And this is where the problem is for Glansman's thrombocenia. Platelets can adhere. You cannot form a solid clot. And uh, that's why you continue to have bleeding or exaggerated bruising. Helen and I were elated when we finally had a diagnosis uh, for Julia. It was a relief to know that all of the symptoms that Julia had had a, a logical explanation. In retrospect, reviewing the case, all of Julia's early symptoms were related to the Glansman's thrombosthenia. During delivery, there is significant trauma, and basically you can have bruising in a perfectly healthy child. In her situation, she had exaggeration of these bruises, and this all suggested that she had uh, an underlying bleeding problem. And the normal bumps and bruises of daily life were too much for Julia's platelets to handle. We just take for granted how our body is able to uh, respond to any kind of minor injury. Even when you walk around, you can actually uh, stretch tissues and cut a vessel. What happens is you get a little bit of blood that goes out into the tissues that breaks down and that's where you get the discoloration from, for a bruise. But patients like Julia aren't only susceptible to extreme bruising. They tend to bleed profusely, even from small cuts. He told us how she bled that much from just a little teeny tiny fingernail cut on her face. What had happened was that Julia had scratched her face and because these platelets weren't able to work well, yeah, they just continued to ooze throughout the night. As terrifying as that episode was, it didn't represent the real threat to Julia's health. Unfortunately, in a situation where you have an abnormality like Glansman's, the greatest risk is internal bleeding. It is the nosebleeds, the GI bleeds, that you cannot treat directly, that are the life-threatening bleeds because you cannot stop them. As scary as it was to get the diagnosis, it was also good to know that now we knew what we were fighting. We just wanted to know what this meant to Julia. Helen and Alan Smith have just found out what's been causing their newborn daughter, Julia, to experience harrowing bouts of bruising and bleeding. Glansman's thrombosthenia, an extremely rare blood clotting disorder. Now they're desperate to know what they can do to get the disease under control. Unfortunately, there really is not a cure and there's no medication that can correct this abnormality. We try to use a lot of preventive approaches to try to minimize the chance of the child having bleeding episodes. The only thing we really could do was keep her in a safe environment make sure that Julia never participated in contact sports. Besides placing a limit on her physical activities, when Julia reaches puberty, she will need medication to keep her from menstruating. Glansman's would really put you at a significant risk to have significant period bleeding to the point that you could die. Just even beginning a cycle could set off a, a bleed that, that would be hard to ever get under control again. There are hormonal uh, medications that can be utilized to control the bleeding. It'll be like the equivalent of taking anywhere from four to eight birth control pills a day, every day for the rest of her life. While they will be able to keep the risks associated with menstruation in check, the Smiths must now face a devastating truth. Certainly in a pregnancy, the bleeding that occurs postpartum can be very life-threatening and so uh, it is recommended that Julia not have children. At this point I was scared out of my mind but Dr. Leitze uh, was extremely optimistic and reassuring that she could live a long and healthy life uh, but it would require uh, work and attention on our part. As they prepare to face the challenges ahead Helen and Alan can't help but wonder why so many medical experts fail to identify the dangerous disease. 
Well, there are less than a thousand cases in the world. It's a very uncommon condition and a lot of doctors have never seen this diagnosis. Today, Julia is 11 years old. And while she continues to bruise easily, she's living a very full and miraculously active life. Although I have band spins, I, I don't let it hold me down. I love to ride my scooter a lot, but I usually have to wear my helmet. We've really made an effort to allow Julia to experience those things that she wants to experience within reason uh, and kept her abreast of everything to do with her disorder. She can live a happy life. She'll never be normal, but she can be pretty close to normal. I grew up, I still want to be a mom. Although I can't have a baby, I would like to adopt one so I could have a child and so that um, that child would have a home. Julia's the strongest person I know. I don't know too many people that could go through the things that she goes through and um, come out as good as she has. She's a fighter. While little Julia Smith's parents noticed something was terribly wrong the day she was born, David Skinner went for more than 40 years before his first symptoms surfaced. In the fall of 2006, 42-year-old David Skinner and his wife Janice were celebrating their 13th wedding anniversary and more in love than ever. Their house was full of joy and laughter, despite the fact that their two children had their share of medical problems. At the time, Justin was 11 years old and Sarah was 7 years old. Both children were born with a congenital defect. Justin lives with spina bifida. My spine is formed outside of my body. Because of my condition, I walk with crutches, and for long distances, I use my wheelchair. Sarah was born in 1999 with a congenital heart defect. I have to take medicine every day, and like every morning and every night. Ever since Justin's been born, we've dealt with medical issues with the kids, so. Life was hectic, but Dave and I, we've always prided ourselves on working well as a team. We were living in Dayton, Ohio. I was a data analyst, and Janice was a customer service representative for an insurance company. We managed our schedule as best we could, and we thought this was how life was gonna be. We didn't expect anything else. Juggling very busy schedules comes easily for Janice and David. They even managed to find time to stay fit. The young parents know their children rely on them, and staying healthy is a priority. Aside from taking cholesterol medication, I was in perfect health. I was physically active and able to do whatever I wanted to do. And that November, David is just as active as ever. We were outside picking up the sticks and doing some other yard work to get ready for the winter. I was doing a lot of bending over, didn't think anything of it. I woke up the following morning and I felt like my legs were not a part of my body. I didn't hurt at all, but I couldn't stand up straight. My knees were bent at a 90 degree angle. I was panicked, so I screamed for Janice to come help me. He couldn't even walk down the hallway. He was very weak and he didn't understand what was going on. Alarmed, Janice rushes David to the closest emergency room. The doctor came in and asked me to stand up but I crumpled to the floor. So at this point, I couldn't even stand up or walk. It seemed that the condition was progressing. And the doctor mentioned that it could be Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an autoimmune disease that attacks the nerves, causing muscle weakness, and in severe cases, complete paralysis. So they did a blood test to see if in fact that was the case. About three hours later, the results were in, and it was not Guillain-Barre. The doctor said, we don't know what's going on with you, but we're going to admit you and do more testing. And then I woke up the following morning, and I knew that I had to go to the bathroom, which was about 15 feet away, and I seemed to walk in there relatively fine. I was a little bit weak, but not extremely weak, and I could walk. I thought... I was getting better or it had resolved itself, whatever the issue was. So I thought, we're gonna go about our day, the doctor's gonna come in and we're gonna be able to say, you know, whatever you had, Mr. Skinner, 
is gone, so you can go home today. Then I came out of the bathroom, and I started slowly getting weaker and weaker as I was trying to get back to bed. And by the time I got back to bed, I kind of lurched onto the bed because I couldn't walk anymore. It felt just like it did when I was in the ER when the doctor asked me to stand. It just came on unexpectedly for me because not two minutes before, I seemed to be walking okay such that I could leave the hospital. Every day the doctors came in, ordered more tests. They did a CAT scan, an MRI, an EMG, and all the results for those came back negative. The doctors were stumped. I'm laying there thinking, am I ever gonna be able to walk again? What kind of father, what kind of husband will I be? I felt I was letting my family down. Then, on his fifth day in the hospital, David wakes up to find his condition has taken a sudden, unexpected turn for the better. I was able to stand and get up out of bed and walk about 75 feet with a walker. So I was wondering, why can I walk today when I couldn't walk yesterday? The doctors couldn't figure out what was going on, so they decided to send me to inpatient rehabilitation to get better. And I believed that I needed to push myself because the doctors said I would get stronger if I did that. But in rehab, David's mysterious illness once again takes a baffling turn. The first day I was able to stand for 20 minutes. And then the third day I could only stand for 30 seconds. And I couldn't understand why I was losing the strength when I was working so hard. It all didn't add up. He would start to fall like he was back to where he started. Perplexed by the turn of events, the neurologist begins investigating potential causes and concludes that the answer is actually very simple. David's relapse is a side effect of his cholesterol medication. I mentioned to him that I'd been taking it for a year and a half, and he said, well, your body could have used it appropriately for a period of time, and then the weakness could have just started even after being on it that long. The doctor took me off the cholesterol medication, discharged me from the inpatient therapy, and sent me home with a walker. We were thinking, once the medication got out of his system, everything would be back to normal, he'd be back to walking, and he'd be stronger again. Every day, I woke up wondering if I'll be able to walk, but I still couldn't stand up without great difficulty, and I would have to use the walker to get around. But his physical limitations aren't the only thing weighing David down. I had to go on short-term disability through work, and I needed to go back to work. My worst fear was wondering if we would be able to keep our house if I couldn't work at all, because I was the primary breadwinner and wondering how much debt we were going to get in. I followed up with the doctor a couple of times, and the doctor would say, well, we just have to wait for your body to accept the removal of that medication and it'll take some time. But as David does his best to stay optimistic, a frightening new symptom strikes without any warning. It was Monday afternoon. We were laughing, having a good time, playing cards. It was his turn and he was reaching for the deck of cards. And then he just started shaking full body. The cards went everywhere. His head was just bobbing up and down really quickly and his hands were shaking. I thought my husband was having a seizure right in front of us. I had no idea what was happening to me. The shaking lasted about a minute before he finally stopped. At this point, we didn't know what was going on, so I rushed him to the emergency room. The doctor assessed him and took the family history, found out about Justin and Sarah, and automatically said he had a stressful lifestyle. He had two kids with disabilities, therefore it's got to be stress. The doctor explains that stress can trigger the production of cortisol, which in turn raises the level of a chemical that helps make muscles move. He prescribed an anti-anxiety medication and he wanted me to go see a therapist. I figured the doctor knew what he was talking about. 